Hey everybody, on this episode of Inside the Documentary, we're getting up close and personal with the director of SCORE, a music film documentary, Matt Schrader. Let's do it. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk, we talk movies. And now, here's Popcorn Talk's Inside the Documentary. Hey everybody. Oh, look at that. John Williams leading the charge here, right here with the, the theme to Superman. Welcoming us into another episode of Inside the Documentary. This is the show where we get up close and personal with the, the creators that bring you all these fascinating stories that you get to watch on the big screen, on your TVs, on your mobile streaming devices. I'm your host, Frank Moran. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Happy Go Jackie. Now, my guest today uh, got to start in the news business and then decided to move away to follow a passion in documentaries. And his latest film is Score, a music film documentary. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Matt Schrader. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. Glad to be here. Oh, pleasure is all mine. This was an enjoyable film. I really... Well, thank you. So so cool. But uh, before we dive completely into that, yeah, uh, just a little bit about you as well. So as I mentioned, uh, you got your start over in news. Uh, you said yeah. you grew up in, uh, up in Northern California? I spent some time. I didn't I didn't grow up as a kid okay. there. I kind of moved around. I'm one of those people that doesn't really have a childhood home because I've been in so many, so many different places. But... Um, but that was my uh, my first job, and I ended up staying up there for several years, and uh, and had some some um, moderate success in the news world, um, and uh, and I left to to pursue this thing, and um, and you know I, I think there's probably some some traces of uh, maybe some pacing that uh, that was you know familiar to me from being in news, mm -hmm. and I I wanted to try to. Uh, introduce that a little bit uh, to some of the documentary filmmaking as well. So for you, well, let's go back, back, uh, backtrack back to your first interest in what decided, like, I want to do, tell, do news stories. Yeah. Uh, and, and investigative stories as well, too. Yeah. So what kind of, what kind of sparked that passion? Was that something you'd always been interested in? Um, I think maybe subconsciously I was a little bit. Um, but uh, the idea of uh, uh, you know, it, it, as a kid, especially you know, high school, college age, you 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 want to make an impact on the world, and I think a lot of it was was uh, was some of that attitude of wanting to, you know, I got into investigative journalism because that is where typically you can kind of hold the power accountable. You know, that's 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 where you do some of the fun undercover stuff. That's where you do, you know, some of the confrontational stuff sometimes if you, you know, you catch somebody doing what spending public funds or you know, whatever it is. Um, and uh, and it's important. You know, it, it's I think one of the more um, it's one of the only ways that I think kind of private industry holds a lot of you know the, the the our our officials in government accountable for what they do and whether they are representing people or not um and that's typically been important you know it's part of the 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 fourth estate um in uh, in the news world is being able to balance out a little of that and i thought there was something attractive about that and being able to kind of make a difference right away uh doing something that helps a lot of people all at once, even if it's just uncovering things that maybe shouldn't be happening in the first place. <laughs> Is that something you can just jump into right away as you join a newsroom? Like, yep, I want to do investigative reporting. Or you got to basically, you know, you start off on, you know, just uh, I'm, I'm running the desk. I'm just, you know, handing assignments out, just kind of learning my ground. And kind of, yeah. I mean, it it depends. There's um, there's a few ways into that world. And, uh, and I was lucky enough that I think I figured it out early on enough. Um, and I got a little bit of a head start with like a mil I did a million internships. You know, I did a mil I went to a million different places, um, both in high school when that back when that was legal at the time, <laughs> and uh, it's not anymore. And uh, then in college, all through college, I, I, I had I don't know eight or nine internships I think over four years, so um, or maybe more actually. But it was a lot, and uh, and I was able to get involved in. A lot of different things. Kind of that that cumulative knowledge that I gathered ended up, uh, I think, helping me out a little bit. So I started out as a uh, investigative and consumer producer, uh, working with uh, essentially a reporter and uh, and piecing together stories that way, uh, really one by one. Uh, sometimes, you know, 
two or three of them a week, sometimes just one big one for six months at a time that, you know, you're really putting a lot of effort into and, uh, and, and trying to make a difference there in, in a story that you end up broadcasting eventually at some point. And are most of these leads coming from just the general public writing to the station or getting in touch and saying, I've had an issue with this and you can't ju- do you necessarily just take that one person you have to wait maybe like we've got three or four people talking about the same issue maybe this is something worth exploring and finding out a little yeah. bit more yeah yeah i mean that's that's typically the way that uh that most of the tips come in um there's also a certain amount of that that is the enterprise reporting it's it's you know it's really coming up with an idea yourself um but that requires you to be really plugged in to kind of what's going on and to see in an industry for instance what something's funny about this part of the industry you can only know that though once you kind of become familiar with it um, and can kind of dig into it a little bit more so you know great example is uh, you know in investigative reporting would be something like schools Um, Mm -hmm. it would be well where do you begin with something like public schools and looking into where money is spent because we're we we know that you know there's a shortage of funds going to many many schools all over the place but there's a lot of money too. Where is it disappearing to? Um, and a lot of it's following that money and and trying to uh, find the documents and the people that will allow you to get to whatever truth that may be that you don't know starting out. And do you find more often than not that people that you need to speak to that can tell you about the truths behind of this are just thankful to have somebody ask them so they can come forward and tell this part because nobody's really asked them or more on the reluctant side, and you're really dragging It's a little it of both, yeah. Uh, the whole whistleblower kind of a thing, um, because you have people that, when there's any injustice, you have people who know that it's wrong, you know, whatever it may be. But a lot of times, those are also people that have poured decades of their lives into something. And if that falls, or if that fails, if that company closes up, or if that, you know, branch of whatever whatever department it is closes, they're out of a job, you know, and, and so there's this kind of delicate dance that they have to do where they're not, you know, they want something to come from it that makes things better, mm-hmm. essentially, that, that remedies whatever is wrong. And uh, and it's, it's our job to be able to kind of uncover that as investigative journalists. Um, and, and hopefully that results as well in, in something, you know, actually becoming better instead of just disappearing forever. When it comes to the confrontation parts, and I've seen many yeah. of those, I'm sure many people that are watching this or listening to this have seen those news stories where they confront right. somebody. Right. For you as the producer, I mean, it's easier for you to say like, all right, reporter, go in there and confront this person. I'll just be here in the truck watching this stuff go down. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> does it become, in terms of the confrontation, does it make it easier for you to be like, oh, it's not going to be me really directly confronting them, so I don't have to worry so much about this? Um, yes, I would say it generally it <laughs> does. That said, um, I, I, most of the time when, when I've been in, involved, in a confrontation um, with with someone who we've we've caught doing something, and and that's really the key is you would only do that if uh, if you know that something's up, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, so you have to establish that first. But uh, I think um, typically a reporter is involved. That's really who you want to be the person that is kind of there, and that way I can take a secondary role with, a, say it's another camera, it might be a camcorder or something to get some other angle of whatever's going on. Um, but I've also found several times when time's of the essence and I gotta step in, and uh, that's a little nerve wracking sometimes, yeah. but uh, you know, it, it is what it is. So, I, you know, I've, I've confronted uh, a lot of state officials being, you know, I worked in Sacramento starting out, so, a lot of public officials at the Capitol. Um, I, uh, I confronted uh, Governor Jerry Brown uh, at one point, and uh, because he was he was uh, blowing us off for a long time about uh, some spending um, that uh, was going on in the department that was not kosher at all, um, and uh, and it was one of those things where it's like. Do you guys want to look at this? Or uh, and th- they were like, nope, nope, we don't want anything. That- well, you need to look at this. You guys, are- well, nope, no. Nope. So we we ended up going to a an event that he was holding, a press conference for something else, <laughs> and it was very public. And uh, and you know, I ended up I forget how it was. I, I ended up getting pulled into that, and uh, 
that's weird, you know, to someone with with the kind of power that a uh, governor of California has, and to be like, yeah. um, you know, holding a microphone. So uh, we uncovered all this stuff. Would you care to take a look at this stuff? And uh, and then they have to kind of dance the walk of like, yes, I'd be very interested. And if you uh, would just uh, get in touch with our office, and then I have to be. Well, we did, and you said you weren't interested in this. So, is there a time we can sit down? You know, it, there's that whole kind of moment that you you uh, you're basically building up to, and if you back down at that point, you end up with something that's uh, it doesn't really do a, a service at all for the viewers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so you you got to kind of keep whatever the focus of that is um, in in view that whole time. So, for you as the as you're telling these stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, being able to reveal these things that aren't uh, up to snuff, so to speak. Sure. These practices, uh, business dealings, whatever. D do you find that the uh, that many people that the response to correct these happens immediately? Do they drag their heels on this? Does that get frustrating when you're pointing these things out and yet you don't see change happening? Yeah, I mean, I th it, yes. Um, it's usually if something's going to change, it's usually pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Even when it's a big State Department or something like that, that usually will take time to enact some kind of a of a change or a correction. Um, the great thing about news, and this is this is very broad and kind of general and and somewhat important maybe in in our modern era. But the great thing about news is you have a lot of people that can be informed at once of something. Um, and I thought that that was a really powerful communication tool. Um, it's something where, you know, if there's an injustice that is taking place, we have a platform in, in the news world to be able to share that and highlight that and showcase maybe an alternative to that or maybe, you know, exactly what needs to be corrected um, if it's not being done by the powers that be, whoever they might be public or private. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I think that uh, typically when you have that many people that are being informed about something like that that maybe they didn't know about, at the same time, there's a lot of pressure to get it fixed. Because all of a sudden, you know, the, the whatever it is, half million people that may have seen uh, the 11 o'clock news that night or whatever it is, they are then uh, saying, hey, wait a sec, what are they doing with my tax dollars? You know, that, that can't go on. This needs to get fixed now. So we see that a lot of times. You know, there's some, some public outrage on a big story like that. Um, but it's also, it's also, you know, a very kind of fulfilling thing when uh, you can fix something that has been broken, sometimes for a really long time. So as fulfilling as this is, as you're working on these stories, when does the idea start coming into your head that, you know, maybe I want to step away from this and start pursuing the idea of doing the, a documentary? Yeah, I mean, it, several years passed um, of doing that, and it, it, it was kind of a, you know, it's a different, a different thing entirely, the film that we ended up making and what I was doing before. I think a lot of the skills are the same. Um, technically, uh, you know, the shooting and editing and planning and structure and a lot of that's the same, but you're not necessarily, you know, we were looking to, to explore the world of film music. It wasn't really like, how dare you, you know, you steal people's money and use it for, you know, your personal car, <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't that as much. So it, it took a very different approach, but I, I think starting out, um, it was the realization of uh, this is a this you know idea of film composers is a topic that has never really been explored um, at any level and uh, why is that and it took a little bit of kind of digging to try to get a sense of why that was um, and really uh, you know the biggest hurdle that we saw is you have all these Hollywood studios that are you know very siloed very secretive. Um, and their their whole business is to make sure that they're putting out some you know whatever product it is the image is very tightly controlled um, and you know it, part of the reason that we love movies is because of all the effort that goes into it you're you're chiseling down this block of marble into this masterpiece and um, or hopefully and uh, and that's where you get some really powerful. Uh, expression. And I, I think that when we realized that it was the access that was the key to being able to do a, a documentary about film composers, 
um, we we I was pretty confident we'd be able to to get access to some of these some of these people. You know, I, I was just waiting to get. I was certain that I could get access to Hans Zimmer, um, who was kind of like he, he yeah. was he was my big get because he's you know all of film scores have in the last probably decade or so. It seems like everyone has has done a little bit of a sound that Hans kind of pioneered mm -hmm. originally, and um, so he's a really important guy, <laughs> yeah. uh, and not just a composer but even a producer on a lot of projects because he you know he considers himself a filmmaker. So um, we knew that it it wouldn't happen right away. We can't cold call his office and they'll be like, sure, who are you again? Sure, come on in for you know a couple hours with Hans. But we built up to that and knew that uh, knew I think from the start that that access would allow us to to make a documentary. So the, already, were you passionate about film scores growing up? And yeah. so the idea is like, boy, it'd be cool to turn to see a documentary about the people that actually compose all this music. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I have a lot of my favorites uh, film scores growing up, and I what I what we realized is everybody does and uh and we we actually you know the few people that kind of jumped into this at the start uh with me realized that uh we weren't necessarily unique for really enjoying film scores we just happen to be the ones that maybe are doing it first mm -hmm. you know are, are are putting together that you know like a feature documentary first and um and i think we've encountered more and more people that have said I love film scores. That's all I listen to. And we, <laughs> we say, really? You know, but because a lot of people just think like they might listen to it at the gym, but there's not really an, you know, I wouldn't have thought that all of my friends were big into film scores, but they all have their favorites. If I'll ask them something, they'll be like, oh, well, I really like this and I really like that and I really... And uh, and and you realize that they're, they're more of an expert than maybe you thought. Um, and... And I think maybe that's what's what started to resonate a little bit in some of our early screenings is a lot of, especially film viewers have really enjoyed seeing some of those big moments from uh, from film uh, and, and film scores. Well, certainly like with, with this, as you're saying, it's an idea that seems like so like this must have been done before. Yeah. Uh, so for you, when you have one of those ideas, like this clearly in all this had to have been done when you get that chance to have one of those rare ideas that really hasn't been mined at all yeah how does that feel to be able once you kind of just check around make sure okay nobody else has really done this what's yep. the feeling like when you realize like holy cow we've got something that's a really original approach to telling the story well there was that and then there was um it's not just making sure something hasn't been done before it's also we're in the golden age right now of documentary filmmaking so the bigger concern to me was is someone else doing this right now like I said, in the next two years, is this the film that we're you know going about to start working on? Is this going to come out, and you know we're going to be just year and a half too late, or you know however it takes long it takes for your average documentary? And and uh, and we tried to poke around a little bit, um, and didn't get the sense that it was. There were a couple other kind of projects going on, um, but uh, but it didn't sound like the composers that we were reaching out to knew about any any project like that and we're you know we're we're like yes you know i think we'll you know all, the time that we've invested so far is not wasted that's good um and uh and then i actually think what was probably important early on was you know we didn't have money um i dipped into my own savings to to finance the first part of you know the equipment that we needed in a lot of the first interviews um and hoped that we could get that back and uh, and we put together a little Kickstarter campaign mm -hmm. and uh, and had some moderate success with that too. And I think that served not only to help us get back to zero, and then also you know be able to afford a couple things like going to London and interviewing some composers there. But um, but it also kind of established, you know, we're we're the people that are doing this film music thing. And if someone else decides that they love this idea too and want to make a film. They can, but uh, but they'll see that we're doing it already too. So um, we just we hoped, you know, that's the the competitor in me, I suppose, where uh, I wanted to make sure that we uh, we weren't wasting our efforts on something that might already be happening. If you had done that research and you had found out that somebody was doing a project like that, would that have deterred you from doing this? Um, I'm not sure. I think we it, it depends. I mean, I think a certain amount of maybe research into 
who was putting it together and how they were, what approach they were taking, um, might have changed the way that we approached it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that we would have made a feature. Maybe it would have been, you know, a series of some some shorts with you know just a few people. Um, but we certainly wouldn't have, have put the same effort into it. Um, and uh, and I think that we, you know, we found probably the most ideal time, uh, really, for something like this. Because, you know, now we're at this point in, in our world where Hans Zimmer's playing Coachella and going on world <laughs> tours. And, and people are like, film music is cool again, you know, and, and all of these famous tunes that people know. And... Um, so I think at the timing, it, it wasn't that we were, that we were, uh, uh, you know, psychic in our, our anticipation of this. Um, but I think it was just luck. We kind of lucked into, uh, working on this right at an ideal time when it was starting to kind of enter the zeitgeist again. Well, I also think too, the, uh, certainly I think in the, in the last four or five years, the idea of like process junkies, people will want to find out how these things are actually made. So this is a subject that really hasn't been delved into at all. Yeah. So in terms of being able to explore something like that, when you're reaching out to these studios where you're saying in terms of access, now that we're kind of more in the age where, you know, it seems at least that people are willing to share a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of how something's created. Yeah. Did you find uh, more of the studios were like, yeah, all right. That that is cool. We would we'd love to be able to kind of show how the how, how kind of music plays a, an important part of the films that we're doing. Yeah, I mean the biggest fear that we had all along was was uh, you know somebody some some suit in an office saying uh, screw those guys. We don't want anything to do. Who are they? You know, and we did get a few people saying who who are they? Uh, that did ha especially early on uh, being kind of our first foray uh, as a team into making a documentary, a feature documentary. Um, but uh, but they were very supportive of the idea. And I think that that enabled us to be able to access certain things that we, we couldn't have otherwise. You know, not just anybody can go into a, a, a scoring session where there's a hundred musicians all, you know, playing a, a, a film, part of a film score at the same time. Um, and uh, and I think we, we were able to generate enough momentum that uh, people felt safe, uh, allowing us access to something like that. And again, like our biggest fear in a, a scoring session, because um, sometimes they only have one take to record, you know, a, a track or a cue as they call it. So our biggest fear is like, don't knock over a tripod, <laughs> like don't, you know, and everyone in the room looks at us and they're all getting paid more than we are for sure. And, uh, uh, which is zero, we were getting paid nothing. Um, but we're like, just don't screw it up for the rest of this. And, uh, and it ended up working out. We didn't, uh, we didn't break anything. We didn't knock anything over. And, uh, and we were able to, to access quite a few of those um, that gave us some really cool access. So in terms of that, you, I, I assume as you're planning this out, you have to be very strategic in who you're approaching and when. And I, I assume as you're building up to Hans Zimmer, it's the idea you want to be able to have a body of work to kind of show. Yeah. Like we've talked to this, 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 and this, and we've been here, here, yep. here, and here. Hans, would you consider being a part of this? Yeah, um, and we we did. We started kind of. We started slow. We started to interview um, some some other people that are kind of in the film music world, and build up a little bit into some of the composers that are really really uh, kind of iconic. And uh, because we didn't want, and we encountered this a couple times early on, a couple composers that said. I'm not that interested. <laughs> We're like, can we please go interview you? And we'd love to talk about this. And it's this is for a feature documentary we we plan to to put out. And uh, we want to talk about this, this, and this, and these films that you did. And we really especially like you know what you did on this thing. And uh, and it's a little disheartening to hear back from someone who says. I'm not. Uh, I'm not that interested. <laughs> I understand if you're busy, but if you're not that interested, but um, but that didn't last very long. And uh, and then probably a few months in, we started to you know there started to be kind of some some echoes from a lot of the the people in the film music world, a lot of the composers and engineers and orchestrators and musicians. Um, and uh, and people started to be like, oh yeah, I've heard about you guys, and we we're like, all right, yeah, it's a first step. <laughs> Um, so I think probably we gathered maybe eight or nine interviews um, with some some different composers that are are pretty well known and uh, and approached uh, Hans and uh, the timing just barely worked out. Um, 
it was uh, it was like two days before we launched our Kickstarter campaign. So we were actually trying to uh, to see if there's a way we can like slip them into the trailer that we had kind of you know cut together as a little video on Kickstarter. Um, and I think we ended up doing it just barely, but uh, <laughs> but that was kind of the start of it. That's because uh, I would mentioned just you know being a professional and 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 good to work with is going to open up a lot more doors than if like, yep. oh yeah, you're telling the story and these guys are jerks. Uh, they, you know, <laughs> they can shut down so many more doors as you try right. to do this. Yeah. Yeah. We ran into stuff like, uh, you know, we, we, um, the biggest thing that we, we worried about was when we would go to somebody's, you know, the studios that these guys have are really impressive. You know, everything is, is the sound is so deadened, you know, there's, there's, fabric up on the wall these these acoustic panels on everything so that when they play a score on their 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 speakers their studio reference monitors um they hear just what they've written and nothing more and uh so you can actually you walk into them and you know it's that effect where your ears kind of all of a sudden you know you you hear that kind of that that nothingness um and uh and so you, sometimes you can hear people breathing and uh and what a camera sounds like when it clicks and uh, when it, whatever. So we, we had to kind of work around a little bit of that stuff and make sure that everything that we uh, were capturing was as efficient as we could mm -hmm. um, and that we weren't kind of, you know, making, uh, making their lives difficult by moving stuff around or knocking things over or whatever. So going back towards the, the beginning, when you decided to set out on this documentary, yeah, uh, being your first time doing a feature length documentary, even though you've been doing uh, investigative reporting and, and mm -hmm. working on that side of it, how do you approach going from that to doing a documentary? Are you doing a bunch of research in other documentaries? Or are you talking to other documentarians, kind of picking the brain? Well, I have always been a big consumer of, of documentaries. So I've been a big, you know, I, I, I can watch three or four of them on end uh, sometimes if they're good and uh and you know i i've i've really liked that so i think i had an idea that i wanted to be a part of that industry a little bit um early on but i hadn't really acted on it and uh and you know in in, in news typically what you have is let's take your regular newscast that you might have or something like you know the nightly news on nbc those each one of those news stories is maybe a minute and a half long. It's short. It's it's something that's really really short, and the people that work on those are very experienced. So they're able to go someplace where we don't know what's going on, put together some story over several hours, and then put that you know a very concise, uh, and accurate and and fair version of whatever's going on into a minute and a half. Um, what we typically did in in special projects, as we called it, in news, we would work on things that are maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, and uh, they might still involve a reporter and a lot of the same structure, but it would allow us to do different things. It wasn't, it didn't have to necessarily just be, you know, here's what happened, and here's what this person thinks, and here's what this person thinks, and here's what's next, and here's what this person thinks. Um, there's not that same structure. And so I think that allowed maybe my organization to um, to expand a little bit. And I, I felt pretty comfortable putting together a documentary. I knew that there's there's a lot of differences. I mean, it, it's kind of weird if you have somebody in a documentary that just gives you a two second sound bite and that's it. You know, that's, you don't ever see him again. Um, whereas in news that might happen. But um, but really I think the structure was was pretty much the same. And it was about finding these important pieces and finding a way to stitch them together into one, you know, one kind of narrative a little bit um, in, in what a film composer does. So for you, when you watch documentaries, what are some of the things that you wanted to make sure for the ones that you don't enjoy? As you mentioned, like I can watch three or four if they're great. And if they're ones that aren't so good, what are things you wanted to steer away from to make sure well, that Well, this is not a universal thing. Um, there are some fantastic documentaries d that do this, but um, I'm so against the idea of a narrator. And, and coming from news, mm -hmm. uh, that the reporter is basically the narrator. The reporter is the one that says, you know, here's what this person had to say about that, and then that person talks. But I've always been of the mindset that we don't really, we don't really need that, especially if there's time to put together 
a film, I don't want to hear some some guy talking. You might be the most famous person. We had this idea, like, maybe we get Harrison Ford to be the narrator, you know? And, and I thought, yeah, that'd be awesome. And then we ran into this issue where we're like, we don't want the audience to have to take Harrison Ford's word for it. You know, like, <laughs> this, is, this is a topic that we're getting all this access to a lot of composers that are telling us cool stories, telling us the way that they work, things that they like, things that they do. They should be the ones that are telling everything. Um, I, there's no need to have somebody else involved. And uh, so I think that was one thing we kind of rebelled against very early on. Um, and we knew it would be a lot more work because uh, that means everything that you would ordinarily explain as a narrator, you have to go interview someone about that and mm -hmm. be able to kind of use their soundbite instead of anything that you would say. But um, but I think it makes documentaries much more authentic too. Um, For sure, like oral histories, I enjoy reading those when because it, it's just, you're letting the people tell the story. You're not really kind of, I don't say editorializing it of sorts, but you're yeah. kind of inputting somebody else's There's opinion. like an interpretation that, mm -hmm. that can be a little bit different. and. Um, and I think, you know, even when you take someone who's a writer about something, you know, my interpretation as a as a newsman um, would be different from someone who's involved in something. It's my job to be as accurate as I can, but it's much better if I can have them tell the story and just kind of use, you know, what I'm doing as a structure for them to be able to convey what's important. In that same way, did you feel the same thing about uh, like text on screen as well, too? You feel like, yeah, we don't want to have that either. We'd rather just have our principals being able to tell a story without putting any additional kind of words on the screen. Yeah, we. De I mean, I definitely wanted to limit that. Um, we thought there was a long debate that we had, even on the lower thirds for for everyone. That just the subtitles that show who the composer is, uh, Hans Zimmer, and you know, for a long time we had um, we had you know, I think something to the effect of. Academy Award winning composer or something. Um, and we had a lot of internal discussion, um, myself and, and Kenny on our team and Nate on our team. And Nate lobbied really hard for, why don't we put the names of some movies instead uh, so that people can actually, they don't have to put two and two together and say, oh, he won an Oscar? What was that for? Oh, it was for The Lion King. You know, why don't we just say he did The Lion King and he did Gladiator and he did The Dark Knight? Um, and be because that tells me a lot more as a viewer, it tells me what this guy has, has done and how it's, you know, how mm -hmm. it touches my life, even if it was just two hours when I watched his movie. Um, and, uh, and I think that was probably the most text that we had in the film. Uh, you know, we didn't really use it for, for much more, except, uh, I think we had one animation where we used text just briefly, but, um. But for the most part, we wanted the pictures um, and uh, and you know some some different pieces of the film scores to do all the talking and not take away from that. Now, certainly, if you're talking about music, you're also talking about, especially with film scores, the imagery as well. Mm -hmm. So, in a documentary like this, uh, being able to show these films, just the licensing amount for these clips, and you're already saying that you know it, it, the budget was really tough for this. In terms of just being able to license all these clips, how how difficult was that for you guys to be able to pull off? Um, well, our our trick that we pulled out of our sleeve was we uh, we ended up bringing on a, a very good, very expensive attorney yeah. who could help us navigate all that stuff because that's not my specialty. That mm -hmm. wasn't a specialty of anyone else that's in our on our team. Um, but you know, I think we have we have hundreds of pieces of multimedia of various sorts in our film, and a lot of them we've shot, but um, but a lot of those are, are pieces of, you know, a, a clip from a movie, a clip from, you know, we have some cell phone video that's in the film just very briefly that, uh, that a uh, studio musician had put on YouTube, um, or Vimeo, one of those, and we ended up uh, finding, finding a really kind of cool way to use that, but, um, but there's different rules for all these things, and how do you find you know, access to the things that you need. Um, and it required a lot of, a lot of, you know, strategic, um, not only in the way that we put it together, but um, also just in making sure that we were approaching everyone in a diplomatic way as well, um, and not, uh, not upsetting anyone in the process. But, uh, but the attorney that we ended up working with is, is a specialist in this stuff. I, I met him when I went to college at USC, taught a class there. 
and um, and he was pretty gung ho about this uh, this movie too. So I that helped, but uh, but uh, we still had to pay him unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> did uh, did that inter- determine like what? What scores from these individuals that you spoke to were featured in the film, depending on which clips that you get access to? Yeah, I mean a little bit. I, I think there were two two factors there. There's that. There's also the uh, the timing and pacing, and we sacrificed a lot in the film to try to make it um, digestible to someone who's not a film score nerd. Um, there's a lot of a lot of film score nerds, obviously, but um, but we were thinking like what your average moviegoer. Um, are they going to like this? Are they going to get this? Um, or do we need to, you know, like, are they going to want to sit through these long kind of sweeping, you know, orchestral cues from Lawrence of Arabia, you know, and your average m- moviegoer, you know, we're at this this period where those movies are more accessible than they ever have been, but your average person hasn't seen that um, nowadays. And, you know, we wanted to be able to find things that were iconic that quickly communicated the shift taking place in Hollywood um, or in film in general at that time, and and kind of use that to to you know give us a little bit of a a linear structure to what's going on musically over the last hundred years or so. So certainly, what I like if I'm reading oral histories is that they'll always do, or like certainly they have the hardcover, they'll do the paperback. And like we added like you know these extra hundred pages filled with stuff we couldn't uh, didn't have time to put in the the hardback. For you, I imagine there are hundreds of hours. There's so much uh, of yeah. just yeah, of just interviews that are g- fantastic stories and anecdotes that you know. Just as you're trying to whittle this down into a 90 minute running time, you you can't put in. Yeah. So for that, is that something you look at for DVD release and like, oh, we'll mm-hmm. add a bunch of this stuff on there as well? Yeah, I mean, it's it's even more than we can fit on a DVD. So um, what we what we did early on with our Kickstarter was we we made. Um, we decided if there's enough people to that want to back the idea of a bonus disc that's basically a lot of raw interviews, some kind of behind the scenes stuff, um, some access that you just don't get uh, as as a even on bonus DVDs because um, they can't hold hours and hours of stuff. Usually they can hold maybe an hour of stuff if the disc is big enough, you know. But um, but we wanted to put a lot of that stuff out there if there was interest, and there was um, on Kickstarter. We we ended up getting a pretty good gauge of of how much people wanted to see some of that behind the scenes stuff, which was very encouraging to yeah. us because we thought it was cool too. <laughs> we wanted it to go somewhere, so um, so yeah, we do plan to release at least one whole kind of version of of several hours of that. I mean, we have hundreds, so we're tr- a lot of the other things I think are going to end up on our YouTube page most likely, um, because it would kind of just be a shame to uh, to just have it die on a hard drive somewhere. Yeah. So, um, so we plan to release all of that stuff as well. One thing uh, during the, uh, one of the statements that I really liked, and I'd never heard this described before, was when Quincy Jones describes it says we call it uh, emotion lotion. Mm-hmm. I, had, I had never heard uh, a score described in that way before. Yeah. So for you, or as somebody that loves scores, doing these interviews, are you just, how much are you just kind of having your you know just learning new things about something that you're so passionate about? Yeah, I mean, uh, myself and and uh, Trevor Thompson, um, our who our producer who conducted a lot of the interviews early on, we game planned every interview. We spent probably a couple hours on every uh, on preparation for every hour maybe that we interviewed someone um sometimes longer in in just making sure that we were hitting not only what made that particular composer unique you know but um maybe it's someone who doesn't really like orchestras that much they like to do electronic stuff or maybe it's somebody that's you know kind of a kind of an indie type of person and they have a certain sound that they try to replicate in certain things um, we tried to build each interview around what that person did, what they specialized in. And we ended up with really cool stuff and, and some depth that you don't typically see in, in a lot of interviews because a lot of people say, Hans, what's it like working with Christopher Nolan? You know, and it's <laughs> like, well, he's answered that question a million times. He's great. It's great. And he's such a brilliant guy and he's great. But we really wanted to get into like, Give us some, you know, when you you think that uh, uh, 
you don't have a sound for a movie that you've been hired to do and months have passed and you still don't think you've found it yet. Like, tell me about that. Tell me about what happens in your head when you think, crap, they're going to find me out, you know, that I, I don't know something. And, and we, you know, I think that we ended up being able to tailor things um, that we that we got in interviews um, and, and take some of the great kind of moments of that and use that in the film. What I liked about that, though, is just how many of them were commenting, like, I can drive by and see the billboard and see my name on this film, and I have not started anything yet. Yeah. And that the pressure starts settling in on them, like, holy cow, I've got to deliver something. That was crazy to us because we encountered, in a lot of the interviews, we went to, some, you know, we looked up this person on IMDb and we said, oh, you're doing the new, uh, the new whatever it is. And they would say, um, yeah, I, I think so. I haven't started on it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've just, I've called the direct, you know, director wants to do it, but, uh, but, and, um, and so that was kind of cool. And we wanted to get, you know, a piece of that kind of, you know, that uh, nervousness um, in in the film. And, and it's true. I mean, a lot of them shared the same experience of not only are you hired to do something, and by do something it means come up with a brilliant idea that <laughs> yeah. transforms the movie into more than what the picture is, but you also start to see all of the media blitz from these Hollywood studios when they start to put out the film to the public and they want the public to see billboards and they want them to see ads online and they want them to see, you know, interviews with different people. Um, if they're really talking up how great this film is and there's no music yet, that's a lot of pressure for somebody, you know, like, okay, go make something creative out of your head. That's, you know, that, that makes this all live up to the hype. You know, it's, it's a little nerve wracking, but, uh, but I think most of them have kind of, found ways around that and uh and luckily i mean everyone that we talked to maybe this is what sets them apart but everyone that we talked to seemed to have that idea just <laughs> just in the nick of time so it would work out and the other thing i enjoy too is and we see a little bit of a just a music spotting session with gary marshall uh which is really cool to be able to, to get some footage of him it's doing his last that. yeah it's his last spotting session that he ever did with uh with john debney that or was, with any composer. That was really cool. And I did not really... It was interesting, and I, and I guess maybe it, it alters if you have frequent collaborators like a Steven Spielberg and a John Williams, people that, that know each other and they've they've collaborated on many other projects. But just realizing how the spotting session can be and hearing some people talk about that, that it can be almost like being on the therapist's couch where you're trying to coax things out of a director that maybe you're working with for the first time. And how it's just not coming up with music, but also trying to pull stuff out of the director as well. Yeah, um... I mean, it, 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 now I have a little firsthand knowledge of this experience because I we worked with a composer um, uh, to just kind of patch up a few things throughout the documentaries. I think just five or six different pieces of music, but um, but it's you're really after you've shot something, you've edited it, you've put together you know something that has been your vision for years. Usually, um, it's it's tough to cut. I mean, you're insecure about a lot of stuff. And even if you've you've shown it to people and they've said that's great, you know, it, there's one you know that a lot of those people are totally BSing you, and that's not true. And uh, and two, um, it doesn't really tell you what to do to fix it. It just tells you whether it works or not. So there's there's an insecurity about about you know is what I've shot and spent millions of dollars in the case of a, a Hollywood film. Is this something that is good enough to be, you know, is this going to get panned by a lot of people? And, um, and then, a, you know, adding on to the list of things a composer has to do, they have to deal with that kind of psychological thing. And they also have to sometimes try to fix a movie. If you know that some part of it is broken and doesn't quite work, what can the music do to kind of, you know, fix that in some way? Is there's a certain warmth or a certain attitude that the music can bring that was missing in the way the actors did something or or what have you. Um, spotting session is the first time the director and the composer get together and they discuss those things. And um, and because you're dealing with creative people, it's it's really emotional interpretations. You know, a composer and a director both have ideas of of how well certain feelings are expressed throughout a film. 
and what needs to happen in order to make those kind of more robust and more powerful and more, you know, to make those really connect with an audience. So the most difficult thing I think with a composer and a director is to find that, to get that emotional expression, you know, out there so that you can kind of find where you are in the process and then you can kind of address everything from that point on. But that's why you see a lot of composers and directors work together um, for decades, you know, uh, John Williams and Steven Spielberg uh, are a great example of this where they trust each other and, uh, and they know what the other person is going to think and uh, they have a little bit, you know, Steven has a little bit of an understanding of, of how John's going to put together the music even when he's shooting something. Um, and there are some other examples, uh, you know, Hans will, will play music for Christopher Nolan on set uh, that, uh, that will help a little bit with the pacing and with what the actors are doing, um, as they did on Interstellar. Um, so there's different relationships, um, and typically a composer comes in at the end of the process, but I think there's been some great examples of a composer coming in a little bit earlier when they're still at least shooting things, when they're still have some ability to correct things if they need to. And, uh, and, and that's where some really cool things start to happen because the composer becomes a part of the central kind of storyline too. Because because the, the frustrating thing I would think would be to a composer to come in so late into the process where the director's already shot, they've already been in editing, maybe they've been cutting to like a temp score. Yep. And then now they're coming to a composer and this director's been living with this temp score that they've kind of like married also that's become like yeah. so synonymous with that image and then you're asking that composer either to give me something that sounds similar to this because this is what I've been well really temp scores are a whole thing yeah. uh, they're, they're uh, and it's something that we we didn't really discuss in the in our movie because a lot a lot has been talked about it in the past but um, but it's something that it, the idea of it is it's music the director finds or that the music editor finds or someone else involved that fits what the director thinks that scene should be. They're they're looking for music. They kind of you know slap it over whatever image that is, and um, and that's kind of what they aim for. So it's really used as a communication tool to a composer. It's to say, I kind of need something that has this kind of a feeling, um, and it allows a director to not have to say, you know, it needs to have you know like how do you quantify certain emotions? <laughs> yeah. It's tough, but music can do it. Um, so that's how it's useful. However, um, composers are not fans of this stuff because what that you can never unhear a temp score. So, if you if you see a film once and you know and it's 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 colored by uh, a, a, some other piece of music that's in there, you're immediately gonna gonna want to go the direction of that kind of emotion that that brought. Um, and a lot of composers like to have a completely blank slate going into something, and sometimes even give several variants of something. Here's one where it's a little bit angry and anxious. Here's one where it's sad. Here's one where it's, you know, and it can change a lot in a movie. Um, temp scores take away from that a little bit, but um, I think a lot of the directors and composers that have really started to, to master that art um, have found kind of the happy medium where here's a little bit of something, but we're just going to play that separate. And then, you know, you, you take as much time as you need and figure out what you think is going to be the best for this film. And what I also like about the film too, is it's not just talking to the composers, but you also go around. It was cool to hear some of the musicians. They get a chance to play this music. And just for me, I just thought like, or this is a, I did not realize their time is so limited with the music that they just yeah. get a day of they play it and then they're gone i always thought like they were together for a few days they've been rehearsing and then now they're going to record we thought that too yeah, yeah. yeah. they got to rehearse it yeah, right look how many so. people <laughs> yeah. um no they don't they don't they do zero rehearsing for this stuff um they come in sometimes on a big project they uh won't know anything about it uh they might know who the composer is but they don't really know much about the film they don't really know and uh they'll walk in they'll be handed sheet music uh, for whatever part they play. Uh, say a violinist is going to get a stack of sheet music and they'll, uh, for the next eight hours that day that they're hired, they're playing things cold. as a, It's just a cold read. It's like, you know, and uh, and they have to make it sound like it's been rehearsed. And uh, that it makes, it sounds good. You can't screw up in the middle of something again when you have a hundred other people that are playing the same piece of music. If you screw it up, you know, there's pressure there too. So they have to be really good. Um, and mistakes do happen, but uh, they're pretty rare. 
And uh, I think that that speaks a little bit to how good a lot of these orchestras are. And just even the way that the, uh, some composers will be decide, I want to be in there conducting. I'd rather be back in the booth listening. Just It's so interesting that each composer has a different way that they want to approach the whole process. Yeah. Yeah. There's So there's two different ways that typically the, a composer will treat that scoring session where they come together, they record everything with an orchestra. And uh, one of them is they conduct. And that's important to a lot of, of composers because they feel like they, they can highlight in the orchestra in front of them, they can point out uh, to specific people what they need. Um, need a little bit more sound from that, you know, even in the moment as they're, as they're conducting, they can kind of, you know, gesture and, and get the right kind of feeling if they're not quite getting it right away. They see that as kind of a shortcut uh, to communicating with a lot of those musicians is you can do it right in the moment as it's being recorded. It saves you the time of having to wait till the music ends and then communicate to someone in the other room and say, hey, will you tell them to play it all a little bit, you know, with a little more emphasis, or, you know. <laughs> so it cuts all of that stuff out because it's the composer who's writing it is the one that conducts. The flip side of that, which a lot of composers have gone to in recent years, is uh, standing in the booth and they hear what music is coming in. And that's important because a composer is part of, of more than just the writing, they also have to be involved in the music editing, which is essentially which takes and which parts of, of the recordings they use. Because sometimes they piece together the first part of one, the second part of another. Um, and uh, the mixing of things too. And so they'll ask just maybe let's just have the brass section play this and then let's just have the strings play this and then we'll combine it later on um, and that gives them a little bit kind of a bigger picture of the whole uh, composing film composing process because they're they're involved in that as well and they can actually hear what's coming through all of the microphones instead of just what's there in the moment is, is it is there room for improvisation if they can if the composer decides to be in the room and conducting i would imagine that oh yeah uh, yeah i mean even if they're in the booth um you know we we encountered a lot of people that were saying why don't we try that again but the last note let's 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 get rid of the last note or you know let's let's make that a different note entirely so that it's a little bit more and i think that's pretty common because up until that point a composer's really working with notes either on a page or on in a computer program. Um, they don't really have that meeting the real world yet. You know, there are times when someone in the studio orchestra will say, this violin can't play that note. It's too high. You mm -hmm. know, you're not even going to, I don't have the ability to. Um, it can't do that. And then they have to say, okay, well, maybe, maybe for that one, then we have a, we'll have a flute try to play that instead, and you know, they they have to try to make adjustments on the fly. Um, otherwise, it won't come out the way that it does in a computer where everything's synthesized and perfect. So, um, so it's kind of cool to see them calling an audible, you know, mm -hmm. when they're they're in the booth and uh, and making things happen. The uh, what else I like too is just the pursuit of different mediums and different ways to be able to. Perform music, whether it's using an, an African, a small African instrument, mm -hmm. whether it's doing something more uh, uh, with using electronic music. I, do you find most of the composers now are they constantly searching for new instruments and new ways to perform music? Yeah, um, I, I, I won't get too technical, but really, there's two there's two things that a composer thinks about um, when it comes to the texture of a sound, and one of them is what pitch it is, how high or low it is, which you can almost think of it as a piano. They all sound the same, but they're in different frequencies. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one is that that timbre, that color, as a lot of composers call it, and like whether it sounds like what makes it sound like a violin or a trumpet or you know something else electronic entirely. Um, it might be the same note, but it's played by something else. It has a very different quality to it. and. Um, what we found that I think is pretty universal among a lot of composers is they want something that is not just a new tune, but they want a new sound a lot of the times too, and something that's a little bit different. So Bear McCreary was a great example of someone for uh, Black Sails. He uh, played, he, they recorded the opening theme song with broken instruments and a, a broken hurdy-gurdy, and, uh, and it ended up, it ended up, 
being what they needed that kind of fit the tone of the show. Um, even though it was not the way you're supposed to play instruments, uh, it's different. And it's something that, that hasn't really been done. And, uh, and it fits really well thematically with, with what, the, uh, what the show is. So um, there's a lot of examples like that. And the guys that do the, the cool experimentation um, are really, they're really fascinating uh, to kind of see work because they want as much time as they can to just go screw around with stuff and hope that they find something that's really cool that they can manipulate and twist and turn into an instrument. Well, and as many people have mentioned there, that film scores are something that's keeping uh, orchestral music around. That uh, that it, without film scores, that could be a, a dying art form. Yeah, I mean, I think you look at a lot of local orchestras in in different cities. Um, a lot of them are struggling right now, and uh, and it's it's nothing new. I mean, this is it's been around for a while. The the kids don't want to go see you know whatever play at uh, w- at the local orchestra, but they they are interested in film, and um, and I think that's because they've encountered it in their lives a little bit more. Um, it is true that there's not that much interest right now in original music being uh, made for an orchestra. Uh, that's pretty much all in entertainment somewhere. Um, movies, film, video games, uh, and television shows. And, um, and I, th- I think that uh, hopefully what our film does a little bit is, is make people realize that the orchestra is, it's, it's old fashioned in a way, it's a lot of wooden instruments, but that's technology too. I mean, that has the benefit of hundreds of years of evolution and finding different sound palettes that do different things and that have different emotional values and and the ways that they interact with us. And as cool as the electronic world is, it's not gonna be able to replicate what an orchestra can do when you have all those musicians there playing these instruments. Um, so I, I, I think that there's, uh, there's some real value in being able to kind of see and appreciate what some of the composers do working with orchestral musicians that, uh, that otherwise might be out of a job. They're watching this and considering learning that they only have that day to do it, I am more impressed than I was before about the talents of these individuals behind everything. They're great, yeah. They're really, <laughs> it's, it's a, pretty it's impressive. Uh, so one, as we're getting ready to wrap up, one last thing I want to ask you is uh, mm-hmm. Hans Zimmer's outfit. Man, that guy, that guy was just rocking it when you guys go to interview him. Yeah. Yeah, we got, um, so his his thing that we've noticed him, he's done this in a few interviews. Uh, he, I think he likes his, uh, he, he likes the purple kind of, he has a purple velvet jacket that he likes. That's sweet. That's, uh, it's pretty kick-ass, it is. Um, and, uh, and he actually, when we interviewed him, I don't know if you noticed this, you've seen the film, but he had these crazy socks, too. Yes, I saw, like, the striped socks, and then he, like, almost like it was, like, paisley pants. Yeah, yeah, it was, you know, <laughs> yeah, I was like, I love it. a little it. different. Yeah. Uh, but we, uh, we, we made a, a conscious effort to try to include the socks <laughs> yes. in, uh, in one of the shots that we had, because it's such, it's just, it speaks to the artist that he is. Um, and and this is a creative guy, you know. This isn't someone that, you know, wants to be in a in a you know, finely tailored you know black suit, you know, go, going to the studio. This is somebody that you know that has has a certain presentation to him too. Um, and uh, and so we, the sock stayed in, and we made it. sure that I was in it. there. Well, and as he says, is that uh, words he can hide behind words, and you never really get to know him. But when he plays music, that's him at his most exposed. Yeah, and it was just interesting, to, and I would feel like that would probably tra- that that applies to all those composers, like you seeing them put their heart out there for these films that they're working on. Well, it's like scores. we were talking about with Temp Score, a director is much is able to communicate an emotion to a composer much more easily through music than through words. It's like where do you begin if you're showing raw footage of some scene and something's happening and saying I need it to be a, like a little bit happy and then also maybe a little bit of tension and then. Ma- or you can play 30 seconds of some piece of music that has those characteristics to it. And um, I think that tells us that music communicates almost infinitely more than we can in a few words. You know, they say 90% of communication is nonverbal, but in music, there's so many things going on that uh, I, I, think, I think it's much more powerful. You know, if you think about movies, 
there are movies that there's a few movies that don't have any score to them and usually it's for some thematic reason Mm -hmm. but um but you would never see really i mean in today's modern age where communication is important you would never see a movie that is completely devoid of any text or any dialogue you know it's it would be it might be something really artistic but it it's not going to communicate to that many people um like something that has powerful music um and i think that that music is you know opens us up to a lot of different emotions that are really difficult to achieve just through actors and cinematography and and the words that are are written on the page and i feel like that it's one of those things where you can you can remove the music from the film and that music you can listen to and they mentioned this in the film that you know you can listen to it in your car or at the gym or whatever and it brings back all the feelings that you've had from that film you can see it in your head yeah, uh, and much different than if you were just to watch that film silently without the, the without that music, it right. doesn't have the quite the same. The score would make no sense. Yes. you'd be like, "Oh, this is kind of cool," but I, I I don't know, you know. I mean, it would still be great music. Um, I'm selling it a little short by saying that because it's it's extremely well written and produced and performed music, and it's very evocative. I mean, scientists are specifically studying film scores because. There's no lyrics that kind of mix up what they're studying. It's just raw emotion. And, um, and, and you know, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, this is an, an awesome film. And seriously, folks, it is, it is well worth your time to go and check out. So, uh, Matt, in terms of uh, what's its next steps here for SCORE? Um, we are going to be uh, releasing in New York and L.A. Um, what are we, in a couple weeks here. Um, so tickets are available for that if you live in New York and L.A. And then uh, score-movie.com uh, is where we have all of our updates for that. We'll be in uh, a lot of different cities as part of a rolling release over the next uh, several weeks. So um, we're, we'll probably be coming to your city, especially <laughs> if it's a big city. We'll, we'll be there at some point. Um, and then uh, we'll do digital um, in, uh, in a couple months here. Um, but really, it's uh, it's just trying to you know get the word out at this point and uh, and try to communicate to you know and thankfully there's a lot of other things happening you know like we said Hans Zimmer's going on concert you know internationally and selling out shows and it's a big deal film music's kind of coming back into the world and uh, and I think uh, I think it's 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 a pretty cool thing um, that people are appreciating that again. So for you uh, getting done with this. Uh, has the documentary bug really fully bit you? Is your next project after this going to be another documentary? Uh, yes, yes, um, it will. It'll. It, I, it won't be about music most likely, but it will be about uh, the sonic spectrum. Oh, nice <laughs> audio in a way. So, uh, so I can't say anything just sure. yet, but it's uh, it's something that's in the works, and we're pretty excited about. That's so cool. So, I excited about making the move from. Uh, news to documentarian. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. Look at yeah. that. So, ladies and gentlemen, my guest today, Matt Schrader, please check out this film, Score, uh, a, a music film uh, documentary. It is incredible. And there's so much I, I for the digital release. Is there going to be, I know you're saying for the Kickstarter that you said they're going to be putting a lot of additional footage. Mm-hmm. Will there be bonus footage? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, there will be. Yep. Yes, there's. We oh. already have a ton of that packaged up, in fact. So. Oh, awesome. <laughs> All right. So uh, is there any, if they want to just, I, I understand you gave the uh, the handle for score. Is there anything, if, just for you personally, if people want to follow up on anything that you're working on, is there a place to follow you on Twitter? Yeah, uh, it's Matt Schrader. At Matt Schrader. Oh, yeah, very uh, or easy. at Score Movie. Either one of those. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I've been Frank Moran. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Happy Go Jackie. We'll see you back here for another episode of Inside the Documentary right here on Popcorn Talk. Take care, everybody. From producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only, and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals. 